when when we think about nonprofits, uh, probably a lot of folks on this call think about the biggest ones uh, that you're familiar with, organizations like the United Way, St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital, the Salvation Army, or Goodwill Industries. But nonprofits are, uh, there are many, many, many more nonprofits than just the largest ones. And in fact, um, they're all around us. And they're not just organizations that we typically refer to nonprofits like 501c3 organizations, which tend to be religious and educational, charitable and scientific. Those are the public charities. But in fact, there are many, many different types of nonprofits. Connor's going to share a list in the chat with you. But these include veterans organizations, Black Lung Benefit Trusts, cemetery companies, teachers retirement funds, social and recreational clubs, and civic leagues and local organizations like the Chamber of Commerce. All of these organizations operate under a section of the tax code in which uh, they are exempt from paying certain taxes um, in exchange for serving a public good. Um, and in, in many cases, uh, people who make donations to organizations, particularly 501c3s, are able to deduct those donations from their taxes for helping a public good. Um, when we think about nonprofits, they fall within a space that on the one hand, you have public organizations like um, a government agency, a government run hospital, or you may have a uh, for-profit company, uh, some of which are publicly traded and all of which have different types of organization that's information that's released on them. For public organizations, of course, you can use public records laws to get information about their finances, what they pay their staff and their executives and their budgets. And for for-profit companies that are publicly traded, they have responsibilities to release this information <clears throat> to this public and to the Securities and Exchange Commission. For nonprofits, we have a unique window into what they uh, spend their money on, as well as what they collect through a form called the 990 form. And many of you on this call uh, may have seen a 990 form, may have used a 990 form, but the 990 form is an annual filing by nonprofits that details a whole host of information. And, and it's going to look a little bit different depending on what the type of nonprofit is and what they do. Uh, and we're going to talk a bit about this today, but it's a once in a year opportunity to understand how these organizations work. Uh, so unlike a publicly traded company where you may get quarterly reports, for nonprofits, you get a single annual report that is often released months after the close of its fiscal year. And sometimes nonprofit organizations can seek extensions to release those. So it could be many months after the close of their fiscal year. Um, they have to file these with the IRS. Some put it on their website, some don't. Um, but our Nonprofit Explorer attempts to provide information on these 990s in, uh, that you can find in one place. And you'll hear more about that uh, today. So what type of information uh, can you find on a 990 form? Well, first of all, you could find top line financials on the organization, not only their um, revenue and expenses, but also their assets and liabilities. So you can look at an organization's financial stability in a couple of different ways, and it's all broken down uh, into a relatively granular level of detail. So you can find out, for example, how much a nonprofit spends on lobbying, how much a nonprofit spends on advertising and promotion, how much a nonprofit spends on legal fees. You could also learn about their board members and key employees, as well as salary information. This is often a top use of a 990 form is to find out who sits on somebody's board uh, and what do the top executives uh, earn at that nonprofit. It's once a year information uh, and it's, it is included in the nonprofit. You can find out information about the grants that are given by the nonprofit organization. So whoever they give money to, you're able to find out by looking at the 990. You're not able to see who they get money from. Uh, they file with the IRS something called a Schedule B, which includes their donors, but those that list is not mandated by the IRS to be public. Some nonprofits, including ProPublica, do make it public, but others, uh, most of them, do not. Um, there's also interesting tidbits that you could find out. You could find out, for example, about conflicts of interest within a nonprofit, uh, as well as whether or not a nonprofit includes first-class travel or charter flights for their executives. Uh, and I know we're going to show you some of that in a bit. You could also find something called the, the contractors that a nonprofit works with that are included as well on their 994. There are some organizations, charitable organizations, that do not have to file nonprofits. So, for example, 
churches or uh, religious organizations do not have to file um, a 990 form. Uh, there are also some other exemptions like state institutions um, and other types of religious groups that don't have to file uh, a 990 form. And, and Connor may be able to share that link as well um, in the chat. The last point I wanted to make is the type of information you can find out on a 990 schedules, which are documents that are included in the 990 form. So for example, if a nonprofit runs a hospital, they have to include what's called a Schedule H as with their 990 form. If they run a school, they have to include what's called a Schedule E with their, nine, with their 990 form. There are other types of schedules that will be included um, if they apply. So if a nonprofit does business with people who are their executives or family members of their executives or members of their board, they have to file what's called a Schedule L form. And if nonprofits have um, information, work with telemarketers, they also have to file forms that include information on how much they receive from those marketing activities and how much they pay for those marketing activities. So that's a brief overview on uh, nonprofits and 990 forms. And I'm going to, oh, so one more thing, which is how often they come out. Um, non Nonprofits file their 990s, as I mentioned, once a year, but different nonprofits operate at different fiscal years, which close at different times. And so not all forms are released at one time in a year, depending on when a fiscal year closes, several months after that fiscal year closes is when that, 990, when that nonprofit's 990 will become public, but you can't necessarily expect it just because you get one on a particular day, all the rest will be available on that day. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Andrea to walk us through the new nonprofit explorer. So thanks, Andrea. Thanks, Charlie. Um, I am going to pop up a, a quick screen share, and we're just going to run through um, a bunch of the kind of features and some uh, tricks to navigating a 990. Um, so some of this, you know, you you may have encountered before. Hopefully, some of these things will be new to you um, because they're pretty new to the site. Um, so this is the homepage of Nonprofit Explorer. Hopefully, you've seen it before. Um, and uh, one of the things that we've added um, in recent months is this little uh, breakdown by state, which will link you over to. Uh, state page that summarizes the nonprofits in your state. So, you know, if you're curious about what uh, what the largest revenue nonprofits in your state are, if you're a state or local reporter um, interested in kind of understanding the nonprofit landscape in your state, um, this can be a good way to kind of get a little bit of information on that. Um, we uh, will give you a count of the um, total uh, active organizations that we know of operating in New York, um, in this case, uh, including those 501c3s, which Charlie mentioned, that's the really broad umbrella of charitable organizations. Um, those are probably the organizations that you are getting uh, Giving Tuesday emails from um, asking for donations uh, today and tomorrow. Um, so, uh, and those are also the uh, that's the most common um, uh, subsection of nonprofits, but it's also, uh, you know, it's it's a really broad umbrella, um, and they can accept tax exempt uh, or tax deductible donations. So, um, so that's a really common um, uh, status that you're going to see. Um, so we're going to give you the the top, the highest revenue nonprofits um, in New York here, and then the highest earning nonprofit employees from the most recent filing for each organization. Um, and um, one thing that really like jumps out to me on this page um, is that uh, typically the top earning employees are going to be hospital from hospitals, universities. Um, in this case, we're seeing um, the Museum of Natural History. Uh, and so and eleven million dollars in compensation, and so to me that's that's sort of I'm going to ask a question: uh, What's going on here? Is that normal? Is that what uh, Museum of Natural History is paying their executive or their president every year? Um, and to figure that out, um, I'm just going to hop over to our people search at the top here. Um, you should be able to access that search from any page, um, and 
luckily, uh, Ellen Flutter has a very uh, distinctive name, so we're probably going to find her in here. Um, and this is uh, this is sortable. I'm going to um, sort it from um, newest to oldest filing, um, so we can kind of see, and then we can filter by compensation. So I'm actually going to. It looks like she's on a bunch of boards. We don't necessarily kind of, uh, we don't want to see the boards. We want to see her job. Um, so I'm just going to filter out those those low, low compensation ones. And here we're just going to get that her compensation over the years at the Museum of Natural History. Um, and we can see that she's earning like ballpark a million dollars per year, um, going pretty far back uh until 2022 and so um the the uh thing that i'm gonna do uh when i <laughs> notice that is just look at the filing and see if there's additional information um so one thing you'll notice on this filing page um and one question that comes up very frequently um is uh so we just clicked into the 2022 filing um this filing says 2021 um, and that is because this number is the version of the filing um, that it's basically an internal um, an internal reference for the IRS so that they know that you know the forms change from year to year. Um, and so um, for the IRS, they want to know like what specific version of the form, what questions were on that form uh, if there's you know if a question wording changes from year to year. Um, this is going to tell them internally what questions this organization has answered. This is not the fiscal year. Sometimes it lines up, sometimes it doesn't. Um, what we use across the site and what is sort of typical in um, in accounting is the, the tax year end. And in this case, um, the Museum of Natural History does accounting um, from July to June. And so we're going to reference this filing as the 2022 filing filing because this tax year ended in June 2022. So if you ever notice a discrepancy between the years um, that are referenced across the site or you know elsewhere on the internet, um, that may be what's going on. Um, and so this is always going to be the number to look for. Some organizations use the calendar year and so that's just going to be December 2022, but in this case it's June 2022. Um, this is also one reason why we can't always line up organizations back to back. You know, if an organization says they gave a grant to another organization in this fiscal year, that organization might have a different accounting calendar. And so they may have received it in a separate fiscal year. Um, that's just something to pay attention to as you're going through a 990. Um, and the other thing that we get a lot of requests for um, are, uh, is the ability to download a filing so you can save it to your research folder. Um, we, uh, we typically post um, PDF versions of filings. However, those come from the IRS and the IRS is about a year and a half behind on releasing PDF filings right now um, due to apparently some technical issues. Um, so what we've done instead is uh, these are, this is uh, electronic data that we're rendering into um, into a visual format. It's an HTML document, um, which means you can, you know, you can copy and paste out of it. You can search it. Um, but if you use this little print, and I'm not sure if you can see the pop up here um, in the screen share, but if you use the little print button, you will, um, you will, you should get your browser's print menu and you'll get a save as PDF option in the printer drop down. Um, and so that's a way that you can just save that full file to your desktop or, you know, your research um, folder, and then you just have a copy of that filing. Um, and you don't keep, you don't have to keep coming back to Nonprofit Explorer. Um, okay, so back on task, we were looking for Ellen Futter's um, uh, compensation, and that is on, I just happened to know this, page seven of the 990. Um, we can see that here, we see the same number. Um, this is the table that we pull um, that people data off of, um, and that's gonna include key employees, which are um, people in leadership roles, people who are highly paid, people who are officers and board members and trustees. Um, and so you'll get sort of anyone who falls into these specific IRS definitions 
um, but you'll always get the board members um, and then you'll get, you know, whatever administrators fall into the key employee category. Um, but we don't get a whole lot of additional information here. Um, and this is this is where the schedules come into play. Um, so uh, as Charlie mentioned, there are a lot of different schedules, different organizations file different schedules. A lot of large organizations file at Schedule J. Um, and we can see that this organization did file a Schedule J in this year. Um, and we're going to hop down to the compensation table, which is very similar to the first one, but has more detail. And we can actually see here that the that her compensation was about a million dollars, kind of consistent with prior years. And then there's other reportable compensation of ten million dollars. Um, and I'm going to peek down at the supplemental information section um, because this is often where an organization will explain what's going on there. Um, so if you have a question, you're like, this this looks strange. Um, in this case, this organization, you know, the Museum of Natural History says. Um, Ellen served as president for 30 years. She retired in this fiscal year. Um, and so she re received deferred compensation, which they also note here, um, the deferred amounts were reported annually as they were deferred are now reported again. This is this is sort of, um, this is sometimes how executives get like retirement compensation. Um, there are sometimes other scenarios where there will be a bunch of extra pay um, in the last year someone served, um, they might have had a bonus um, kind of consistent with however many years they served, they might have had a severance payout, um, and usually there will be an explanation either um, in the supplemental information um, or in Schedule O, which is the general supplemental information <laughs> um, schedule for the whole 990. Um, so that's my little rabbit hole, um, which, and the moral of the story is always read the supplemental information. And if a number looks strange, um, don't report it immediately. Do a little more research, see if you can figure out, um, you know, if there's other context there. Um, and uh, another caveat is that sometimes this data is really messy. Um, these are, it's humans filling out these forms. Um, if you leave off a decimal <laughs> accidentally, a reported salary might go from $34,000 a year to 3.4 million. Um, and if that doesn't look right, um, it might be a mistake. Um, so again, and organizations can file amended returns. Um, so if you go to the organization's page, um, which we can do over here, we will always in that tax year, um, the link that we're going to show is a link to the most recent document we have. We'll also provide um, links to the other the prior versions that we have. Um, but if a number doesn't look right, it may also have been amended. And we do index every filing in our search. Um, and so, so it might show up in search, but it might be from an earlier version of that filing. So again, <laughs> a little bit of caution with just directly interpreting 990 data. Um, okay, so now we're on the Museum of Natural History's main organization page, um, and we're going to give you a little bit of an overview where it is, how long it's been tax exempt, um, and the employer identification number in the same way that, um, you know, if you're, uh, you know, if you're filing taxes, you have a social security number, um, employers have an EIN, an employer identification number. If you're looking for information about this organization on another site, if you're requesting it from the IRS, this is the number that you're want, gonna wanna grab. Um, a lot of nonprofits have really similar names, um, but this is the unique identifier for this organization. Um, and again, we're gonna give you a little bit of information. Um, this is a 501c3, so you can make a tax deductible donation. And we're gonna pull out some revenue information um, so that you can get an idea of, you know, what does this organization, what do this organization's finances look like over time? Um, and then jumping down, we will um, give you for, if, if we have an electronic filing for an organization, we can actually extract um, the financial data for, for that filing. Um, and so we will um, show you kind of some, some drill downs of, of that organization's finances for that year. You can always get more when you click into the filing. Um, 
And then that that um, employee and officer um, information that we pull off of page seven of the 990 um, or different page if it's the 990EZ or the 990PF, which uh, you know, different forms, different pages. <laughs> um, always fun to navigate IRS data. Um, and then you can kind of scroll back to prior years um, and see, um, again, that drill down of what what's a little more detail on the finances of this organization. Um, and one thing I'll note here is that we, if we have an e-filing, we can tell you when it was filed, when the organization filed it with the IRS. Um, and so uh, you can see June 2022 is when this organization, when the Museum of Natural History's fiscal year ended. Um, they filed nearly a year after um, after that tax period ended. Um, organizations by default have five months to file a 990 after um, after their tax year ends, but they can file for an extension. Some file within a couple months, some file up to, especially larger organizations may take a year to file or more. And then there's some processing time when after submitting to the IRS before the IRS releases that document to us. Um, so there's gonna be, um, you know, we're always working on a delay with 990 data. But um, if you want to know what the Museum of Natural History finances look like, in the fiscal year 2023 um that year has already ended but we're probably not going to see that filing on nonprofit explorer until i'm going to guess june july august of next year um depending on how quickly the irs turns that around we can kind of see they're usually filing around mid-may um so that looks pretty consistent so we're probably going to get this filing next summer sometime and if you don't want to keep checking back on Nonprofit Explorer, this is my favorite new feature and one that I am using quite a bit already. Um, you can hit subscribe and you will be subscribed to email alerts when we post a new filing. Um, and uh, so I'm already logged in. You'll get a little login confirmation just so we, we're not like spamming people accidentally. Um, but I'm not subscribed. I'll get an email when we post a new filing. For the Museum of Natural History. That's probably going to be about once a year, though they do also file audits because they spend federal grant money. Um, so that might you may be getting a notification twice a year. It will notify for both of those types of filings. Um, and I can hop over and manage those um, subscriptions here. Um, so I can see I am opted into Museum of Natural History filings. I'll get an email um, the next time we add a filing for this organization. Um, okay, so <laughs> the next uh, section of this very, very quick run through, um, we're going to hop back to the home page. Um, I know there are a lot of power users of Nonprofit Explorer. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, we've gotten asked a lot is what are the like Boolean search terms? How do you do and or 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 strict search? Um, and we um, have added a little cheat sheet for you um, so that you can drop down this advanced search box and just see, you know, if you surround something by quotes, it'll be a strict search. Um, if you use the plus, it'll be and. Um, so you can do, you can kind of refine your searches a little bit more. Um, and then the other big search thing that is um, new is that you can actually just hit search um, and you will get to a page where you're just, if you don't put anything in the search box, you get to a page where you're just browsing all organizations. Um, and so uh, here I can, and it's going to be sorted by revenue by default. So you're going to see the biggest organizations. Um, I can drill down if I'm interested in a particular state. I live in Vermont. I might want to see all the Vermont organizations. Um, I can kind of filter by revenue, see, you know, some specific um, organizations that that fit into those revenue brackets. Um, by category, um, but other filters is, is um, something where, and there are a couple things here that Charlie mentioned, um, we have pulled out, if an organization said it um, operated a donor advised fund, this is a way that organization that um, uh, people, foundations can sort of allocate money to an organization that then distributes money to different organizations. Um, 
uh, something that's been reported on quite a bit recently. If you just want to see everyone who said, yes, I operate a donor advice fund on their most recent filing, um, you can filter there. If you want to see everyone who said, I operate a hospital, I operate a school, um, you can use that filter. Um, you can also find just every organization that reported an excess benefit transaction on their most recent filing. That's um, because the nonprofit, you know, nobody's supposed to make um, make a profit off of this organization. But if uh, you know, or if someone sort of embezzles money from the organization, if um, you know a, a contractor is overpaid, if someone, if the organization ends up paying above market rent to a, a you know someone who's involved with running the organization, um, that's going to be um, that's going to be considered an excess benefit transaction. Someone made a profit off of this, you know, tax exempt organization, and the organization is required to report it immediately upon discovering that transaction. Um, and so we can actually just see every organization that said yes, we discovered a an excess benefit transaction. If we click into one of these organizations, um, we'll see we'll see that information pulled out right at the top, and then there's going to be a little bit more information. And we're going to tell you exactly where to find more information. So you can click into that filing. You can head to Schedule L and read about what happened, um, why this organization is reporting that. Um, and then lastly, um, we've gotten we got a lot of uh, questions about finding those um, finding donors to an organization. And again, um, Schedule B is redacted. So uh, you know, unless that organization voluntarily uh, releases its Schedule B, or if it's a, some private foundations don't get Schedule B redacted. So you can find some data in Nonprofit Explorer, but usually you're just going to see restricted if you click into a Schedule B. Um, but we can find organizations that said, I gave a grant to a nonprofit. Um, and for this, I'm just actually going to throw in non ProPublica's uh, EIN. Once again, that EIN is really useful for finding organizations. Um, we can see this brings up ProPublica. We can also click over to the full text of filings, which you can, um, which we index if we have an electronic filing, we'll, we'll let you search everything that was on that filing. Um, and I know that Schedule I is the grants table. And so I'm just gonna filter to Schedule I, sort that by, new to old filing year. And I can get like a pretty good idea of what organizations said we gave a grant to ProPublica. Um, one thing this isn't going to capture is the 990 PF, which private foundations file. Um, there is no field for the EIN on that form, unfortunately. And so we have to do a text search for the organization name instead. Um, you'll notice that ProPublica has a space in its name, technically. And so this is where we can actually do that uh, Boolean search. So I'm going to just search for, to find those private foundations that said, hey, I gave money to ProPublica, search for ProPublica, and or, that's the or, ProPublica with a space. I'm just going to search. And then again, I just want private foundations because I already got the the 990 grants table. Um, and we're we're getting a thousand some matches for ProPublica. This is obviously it's like we have a pretty distinctive name. Um, so this is going to be a little bit harder if you have an organization that has a really common name, if there are frequent typos or or you know or um, abbreviations. But that is one way to kind of track down any organization that's mentioning an organization in their filing, um, which can be really useful information to have. Um, and then the last thing I want to touch on, it's been a very quick tour, um, is if you scroll to the bottom, um, you can actually get a link to all of the data that we use to populate um, Nonprofit Explorer. We get a lot of questions about, you know, can I just get a list of every, every active nonprofit in my state? Um, and you can get that um, through exempt organization profiles. The IRS uploads that data file um, with a breakdown for specific states um, every month. Um, so that's a really useful thing to know about. If you're looking to dig into the data yourself, you can also get everything else that we 
um, used to populate Nonprofit Explorer at various places, most of it is from the IRS. Um, and I am gonna stop my share and uh, pass off to Ken. Thanks, Andrea. That was uh, extremely comprehensive uh, in short order, and I really appreciate that. Um, I am also going to share my screen real quick. I find sometimes a, um, I find myself a lot of the time when I'm um, uh, reading the news, I will go back and if I see something about a nonprofit uh, doing something wrong, I will go back and see if they could find, you know, essentially the crime on the 990. And so I'm just going to walk you through uh, one of what I think is sort of the easier ones to understand. Um, which was a story in the New York Times in 2021, uh, not one of David's stories, I'm sorry, David, but you will uh, talk about yours, I'm sure, very soon, um, about uh, an executive at a um, nonprofit, uh, Mental Health House the Homeless, who was bringing in a million dollars a year, um, hiring family members, uh, and um, had created several companies that uh, he was then uh, directing funds toward. Um, and I believe the city and the state have stopped uh, working with that nonprofit. Um, and so I am just going to share my screen here, much like Andrea. Um, this is the story here. Um, and so if you go in and you read it, uh, you read about this man, Jack Brown III, um, and you see right at the top a couple of facts. Uh, the city uh, awarded more than $352 million to nonprofits run by Mr. Brown. Um, it had channel contracts worth $32 million into for-profit companies tied to him, allowing him to earn more than a million dollars a year. Uh, millions more have gone to real estate companies in which he has ownership interest and that he has hired family members um, and given them perks. Uh, and further down here, um, it says, in addition to serving as the chief executive of the nonprofit uh, called Core Services Group, and I will just copy and paste that, so I will show you how I do this. Um, Mr. Brown started a security guard company that polices his shelters, a maintenance company that makes repairs in them, and a catering company that feeds the residents. Uh, he heads each of those, collecting a total compensation that tops a million dollars. And he is the highest paid shelter operator in New York, for an interview of available records. And so when I read something like this, I will immediately go and grab the name of the nonprofit, and I will put it into our handy-dandy search interface right here. Um, as Andrea said, and I will just uh, reiterate, we can search three different things on Nonprofit Explorer. You can search the name of a nonprofit. Um, and to answer a couple questions, if you want to search for a city, if you put a city in here, um, so, for example, I am from Boca Raton, Florida. Uh, this will pull up uh, nonprofits within Boca Raton, as well as that, as well as uh, that um, have it in the name. But that will help you uh, find uh, nonprofits within the city. But I'm going to go back to Core Services Group right here. Um, and I see two, um, but I saw this was just called Core Services Group, uh, and that was what was named in the New York Times piece. Um, I'm going to keep note of this one for later, though, and I'm going to pop this open. Um, and, you know, as again, um, Andrea showed you, we have some information here. It's a 501c3. Here's the revenue, expenses, assets, and liabilities over time. If you want to, I'm actually just going to go ahead and subscribe uh, because I am actually interested in what the next one of these does. Uh, and we have a couple of information, uh, pieces of information we pulled out saying that they've reported conflicts of interest transactions, which seems like potentially an understatement um, to what the Times story said. Uh, you can pop right in here and you can see. You know, it's interface the um, uh, quick top line financials, and you can see right here uh, Jack Brown, who uh, was mentioned in the story, and you can kind of add this up into your head. And it's close to a million dollars, but not quite. Um, but this was a story that was published in 2021, so it was actually the 2020 filing. Um, if you get here again, it's close, but not quite. But we'll just poke around um, and we'll see what we can find. Uh, first, when I take a look at this, I um, took a quick note of the address. Um, 45 Main Street in Brooklyn, not too far from where I live. Um, sometimes I'll read through the summary to see what it says. Uh, there are these sort of more top line financials kind of similar to the ones we've extracted, but I just kind of want to dump, jump down and see if I can work backwards to see how the times um, did this. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take a note of these uh, monetary amounts, and this looks to be about 800 and some odd thousand, which is close. Um, but I'm betting that they found um, more information on that. That's still a lot of money um, to pay a nonprofit executive. Um, and that, if I were uh, a reporter, which I am, uh, would ping my uh, senses and I would be interested in learning more about that amount of money. Uh, and I'm also going to pop down to the independent contractor section because I do remember where it said 
that he had created companies um, that he then paid himself through. And one thing, uh, you know, I wish I could um, pull the class on this. Oops, I accidentally changed the size of the font. Um, I hope you can see this, but I, I wish I could pull the class to see if anybody could name what about these three nonprofits seem to stand, or these three companies appear to stand out to you? Uh, anybody? It is that they all share the same address. That that would ping my radar really, really hard. Um, if you go and you look up who runs all these companies um, in any sort of uh, state attorney general database or uh, secretary of state database, you would see um, that he is the principal of the company. Uh, and also it's listed further down on the form that he is the principal of these companies. Um, and you can see that they have directed $18 million, again, as the story said, for security, $3 million for food distribution, and about a quarter of a million dollars for property management. Um, again, these were lead items in the story, and they are just right here for the taking for anybody who would um, want to review these forms. You know, it also said that there was um, conflicts of interest transactions, and I know that that's on Schedule L. We also write over where we say that. We say it's on Schedule L, so you'll know where you can click. So you click right here to Schedule L, um, and I would just be interested in like poking around a little bit more into those conflicts of interest that they've listed. Um, you can see that they're that they are a subsidiary of a company called Core Companies Inc., which uh, I do not 100% know where that is, um, and that there is a loan um, uh, from that company uh, to here. Uh, you can also see some of these companies that were listed earlier. That Core Development Company LLC is owned by an officer um, uh, of the organization. Again, we could look up the records of that company in a state database and see who owns that company. Uh, and you can see all of these various companies, including uh, this one right here, which is somebody's brother who is making $175,000 in, com uh, in compensation. Um, and we're getting really close. There's one thing that's nagging to me, and I don't know where that uh, million dollars came from. There's two possibilities that I can see. One of them is if we go into Core Services Group and Y Inc., it turns out that this is also owned by Jack Brown, uh, a nonprofit also owned by Jack Brown where he is making an $182,000 uh, most recently. But in the year they wrote this, $210,000, uh, I am pretty sure that if you add up the $800,000 from the main nonprofit and the $200,000 from this one, um, that would equal up to about a million dollars. It's also, and maybe David or Andre, you know the answer to this, it feels like this one should be listed as a related entity on the nonprofit, but it is not. Uh, and so it's the um, finances here are not actually reported. His salary here is not reported on the main nonprofit. So uh, very quickly, I have like read this story and I have gone back through here and I have found uh, several of the items in the lead of the story just from reading it. And I know that like journalism is significantly harder than that, right? Like somebody had to have a, uh, a tip probably, right? Or a guess that they should be doing this. And the story is filled with fantastic details about moldy bacon and things like that, that you can only get with on the ground interviews. But just from reading these documents and using sort of the nonprofit explorer tools that give you hints and leads um, into finding these sort of related companies, uh, you and if you had searched his name through the name search, it would have pulled up other companies that he's listed in, although Jack Brown is not the most uncommon name. Uh, then you can see how you can start building up a basis for doing more reporting. And on that note, on the basis of doing more reporting, we have Mr. David Brantfold here uh, from the New York Times, whose beat is covering nonprofits. Uh, <laughs> and David, well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, did you want to start off with anything uh, that you uh, wanted to Just talk the, about? being here is like a small measure of my gratitude at the many, many hours I've, sp I've spent using Nonprofit Explorer. I think which I'll do is the, it's the best thing out there. So, and I use it all the time, every day. Thanks. What's the weirdest thing you've ever seen on 990? The weirdest thing. Uh, I mean, I have to go back to the Trump Foundation. So the, I, that was the first nonprofit I covered was Donald Trump's foundation. Um, and we, in our course of our reporting, found all kinds of weird things he'd use the nonprofit's money to buy, like a Tim Tebow football helmet, some portraits of himself, uh, which they had not listed as assets, even though they were they were charitable assets. After our reporting, then we the next year in the 990, we got like signed Tim Tebow helmet, portrait of Donald Trump. Those things were listed as charitable assets, although we still don't know where they are. Uh, they ended up on, on Trump's 990. So I think I'll have to say that. When you um, go and when you start like researching a company, right? I, I, mean, I mean, I guess the first question would be like in your process, I assume you're not just delving through 990s all the time, but maybe you are. What What is sort of your process from getting like, 
from sort of like a tip to um, getting into the 990. And then once you get to there, like what are the first things you look at? One of the dumbest but most useful things I can recommend reporters do on um, on any beat, but on the nonprofit beat particularly, is to use Google Alerts. I use that as like a, a sort of a, a you know a regular sort of feed of things that might be interested. I have Google Alerts for nonprofit arrested, nonprofit convicted, non, you know, and any other specific topics that I'm interested in with nonprofits. Um, but once I get a tip, whether it's through that from another reporter, um, just from a source. Uh, the non, the non, the 990s are where I start. So the first thing I do when I'm, start, I'm digging into a, a nonprofit story is, well, there's two things. The first thing is to take the 990s that I can find um, and make a spreadsheet, make a spreadsheet to track the key, you know, read the 990s, obviously, but you're making a spreadsheet to track changes in revenue, changes in spending, changes in personnel over time. You know, so many of what we care about, the things we care about with nonprofits begin with financial gain or financial distress. So to be able to understand how their finances change over time, how their people change over time, and to, to look look through those 90s to, 990s to look through, for changes over time, but also to try to sort of map the organization. Is this just one standalone group with a small set of uh, people in, in charge of it, or is it you know part of a web of things? You know, sometimes you know that going in if you're looking at a hospital or a university. Sometimes it's surprising to find what looks like a small organization has links to other groups and it gives all its money to one particular group or it lists other groups as related organizations. So I make that spreadsheet track those factors over time. And then that gives me sort of a story, you know, a list of things that I'm interested in. But then I go to a Google doc and I write down, you know, what are the questions that I'm interested in answering? What are the things that stuck out on the 990 that I want to learn more about? Uh, the other thing I do right at the beginning, um, and this is, uh, you, you can do this if you only have a week because it takes a little time, but if you have longer than that, or you think you're going to be covering a non nonprofit for a long period of time, is to go to the IRS and FOIA um, their most recent, their, for the, the, what they call the IRS Form 1023, which is the form that uh, nonprofits have to file when they, when they seek tax exemption. Um, you can't get that, sadly, on Nonprofit Explorer, but you can get it by sending a form to the IRS. It takes about a month or a month and a half. Um, and sometimes that tells you things that the 990s won't tell you. That's sort of the beginning of the process. Then you know, okay, is there a story here? You know the people you want to call, and you know the sort of trends and mysteries you want to solve. Uh, please know that we have attempted to get 1023s in bulk, and Andre is the bane of several uh, records officers um, at the IRS uh, because of this request. And she had to she got a, uh, a, a SD uh, card full of one month of uh, 1023s, probably for the rest of her life. Um, <laughs> and we have no idea when we'll ever uh, get get more of that. Um, I just when, got one today. It's in my <laughs> mailbox. Oh. <laughs> when you go through um, and you're trying to make these connections, right? Like I know I have done this and I have ended up in like a uh, crazy person land where I've like, I've drawn the strings on the wall and I like, I know there's something there and it's just like driving me crazy. How do you get, get yourself, how do you keep yourself from like getting too deep into the sort of conspiracy theorist, you know, section of like networking nonprofits together? Well, I guess there's two main ways. The, the one is that, you know, you're not, you're, you're trying to look for um, a closed loop. Like, you know, when we talk about an organization that's like interconnected in a way that's interesting to us, you're looking for a closed loop. There's a set of nonprofits that from the outside appear independent, but in reality only deal with each other. Uh, so we had a story earlier this year about this group uh, that was funding this. There's a, a rich uh, philanthropist in the U.S., who was sending money into a network of uh, U.S. nonprofits that then send it out to groups that all funded basically Chinese propaganda, pro-Chinese propaganda. And if you looked at all, so it was a chain of groups, him to a, um, to a private foundation, to a couple of 501c6s, to a couple of 501c3s. If you looked at the, from the outside to at any one of those individually, they all seem to be independent. But when you started looking at them more, you realize, oh, wait, this group gets all its money only from these two other groups. You know, this group only gives its money to these two other groups. If you start finding that situation where you're in a closed loop where every, the organ, you know, there's four or five groups or however many groups that only deal with each other or primarily deal with each other or they share people, addresses, you know, you know, the, in, there's any sort of signs of that overlap, then you're on to something. But right. You, you don't want to get in a situation where you're 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 trying to trying to sort of make causality out of what may be sort of casual connections or the fact that a group may be, you know, these two groups may be in the same field. That's sort of the way to do it with documents. The other way is if you're concerned about, you know, trying to get a reality check on whether you found a conspiracy or just found some coincidences, 
that's when you have to start talking to people. I mean, the document, these documents are great. That's what I love about nonprofit reporting is the documents are, will take you so far. But at some point, you got to start calling the people and find out, you know, you know, start asking questions about what they know. And, and obviously, then it's just the sort of standard reporting trick of imagining concentric circles and calling the people in the outermost circle first, meaning the people who are the least connected to the people at the center and the least likely to sort of snitch on you to them. Um, and if you start calling those people, you know, ex-employees, you know, ex sort of extraneous employees, people that have some connection but not are not central, and they say, oh, yeah, there's a connection. We all go to the same retreats. We all go to the same board meetings. Then you know you're on to something. But they may tell you, no, it's just a coincidence. That makes a lot of sense. And there are a couple of questions, I think, based off of something you said, which is uh, you said that the IRS responds to FOIA requests within two months. But I think what you meant was the IRS will respond to this like specific form request for a 1023 within about, and Andrea, you get about the same, right? About a month or two for that. Yeah, I would say like six weeks and they usually yeah. fulfill it on paper. So you get a big packet in the mail. So this is, this is actually a really important distinction. The IRS, for whatever reason, does not like the word FOIA. If you say FOIA to the IRS, they act like they've never heard it before. Mm -hmm. um, what they what you want is a form 4506B. And someone hopefully somebody can put the link into, the, into that, that into the chat. A form 4506B. You fill that out and you send it in by email or you can fax it, although lately the fax machine hasn't been working. Um, their fax machine, not mine. Um, you can you send that in and that is it's like a FOIA request, but it's to them, it's a it's not a FOIA request. And they will send it back on paper by mail within six weeks or two months. Yeah. And there are some people who are worried about the nonprofit finding out that you've submitted a request to the IRS for that. My understanding, and I'm going to ask both of you, they don't get notified. The IRS just makes a copy and sends it to you, right? I've never had, had that happen, no. Yeah. And the, the one other thing people may want to know about documents, too, is, you know, it takes a while. Actually, it's much faster for us to get 990s um, lately. Again, we've seen them get filed and us get them like a month and a half to two months later, which is sort of unheard of speed. Um, but speaking of forms you can file with the IRS, you can ask the IRS for a copy of the 990 if we don't have it and you think it's been filed. But also you can ask the nonprofit itself um, in the nonprofit uh, by law, though I don't know if there are any teeth to that law. Uh, must give you a copy of the the latest 990 that they have filed. Is that is that right? Yes. And what I th this is a useful thing if the nonprofit sort of you know if you're not worried about giving away your you know if you think there's some element of surprise you need to preserve with the people you're reporting about, don't do this. But if they, these are people that already know you're there or that you don't care if they know you're out there, if you've passed that point in your reporting, yes, email them and you cite. I, I'm sorry to throw another number of people, but section 6104 of the tax code. You say under 61 section 6104 of the tax code, you know you are required to provide copies of the mo three most recent 990s and your IRS form 1023 upon request. So I'm requesting it. Um, and if they try to give you any, you know, like what's, ask you questions about what your story is about, or, you know, you, there's no leeway in this. And then I, that's what you write back and say, like, there's no, you know, you don't get to decide. There's no, the section 6104 does not make any provision for you to screen this. If I ask for it, you have to give it to me. Yep. And, and I should, one more thing about that. Sometimes I always recommend doing that at some point with even if you think you've already got the 990, because sometimes if you do that, they will screw up and send you the, the 990 with the schedule B, the donors attached. So like that doesn't always happen, but it's happened to me enough that it's worth doing. So even if you already have a 990, ask for it anyway, and maybe you'll get lucky and they'll send you the one with the donors. That is true. I read a, story, I read a Daily Beast story recently uh, related to that. Um, so if you had reversed search some of that in nonprofit explorer, you would have found it anyway. Um, I think it, we have time for just a few questions. I, I hate to interrupt your questions. Ken, do you have one more that you want to no, ask? I was going to ask. The, I was actually just going to ask David if there's anything else you want to leave folks with. Good okay. resources, any any tips or tricks or anything like that you want to leave folks with. My one other tip is that sometimes state level state so many states have charity registration databases along with the IRS, and there are a few that post them a lot faster and sometimes post new other better information. Than, uh, than the you know more detailed information than the IRS requires. I particularly recommend the Hawaii Attorney General and the New Mexico Attorney General, their charity searches. Even if your charity is not based in one of those states, if it operates, if it's like a national charity and it operates in one of those states, um, we got great stuff on Project Veritas once from, I think, the Hawaii Attorney General. So keep those in your in your repertoire because sometimes you'll get stuff from them you can't get anywhere else. And I know, Charlie, the, on the questions, I do see um, so a question here that someone asked that feels like we did not really quite 
uh, talk Go about, which it. is um, with the best way to um, check nonprofits before donating. And we sort of talk a lot about investigative reporting, which is uh, what we all do and therefore where our brains go as we do this. But I don't know, like uh, Charlie or Andrea or David, if you have thoughts on the best sort of spots in Nonprofit Explorer or the 990 to check before you donate to a nonprofit. Well, I, I guess that there's a lot of a lot of things you should check before you donate to a group. But the, the best things to look at when you're looking at a 990 are Look at how they spend their money. On the first page of the 990, it shows you what do they do with the money that they that they bring in. Do they spend it on salaries for their employees? Do they give it to other groups? You know, and then you can scroll down to the things Andre Andre's been talking about, looking at salaries. Okay, do they spend 80% of their salary on one person? Do they, you know, what do they pay their executives? And then at the very end of the 990, you can see the groups they've given their money to. So in there, there should be some description of both what they spend their money on, and then you can get some measure of is this in a charity that's out to enrich itself or enrich its contractors, or is it is the money going out the door to help other people? They, they could always lie, and there's some there's some opacity in these 990s that make it hard to be sure. Um, but if somebody is grossly wasting money or spending all the money on fundraising and overhead, um, you can see that on the 990s. And just to <laughs> say one thing, which is that it just because they spend a lot of money on salaries doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad nonprofit. ProPublica spends over half of its uh, money on salaries, but we're a news organization, and so our job is to spend it on people and, and reporting. Sorry, okay. That was exactly what I was going to say. Um, so sometimes if, if you know, a site is calculating like the overhead percentage um, for an organization, like it's worth thinking about what is this organization's service as well, because if that is mostly salaries, um, then, you know, that's additional that nuance sense. to the one number that they might be showing. Great. Well, let's dive into a few questions. Um, which is uh, anybody can tag this. Which is what does the IRS do to review nine? You know, to review nonprofits. Are they consistently reviewing nine nineties that are submitted, and do they revoke nonprofit statuses based on investigations of or red flags? Is this common? I can take that. The IRS um, does I, I does not audit. If the, the question is, do they? Does the IRS audit every group? No, the audit rate is extremely small. It's in the it's in the single digit per, single digit percentage, um, and they do sometimes revoke tax exempt status um, for violations, but that's also extremely rare. So there's you know there's more than a million nonprofits active in the U.S. and very very few of them get audited. Even fewer get revoked. Um, the, I would find that the, the bulk of the charity enforcement, the people who are either looking for bad and misleading nonprofits are more often the state level regulators like attorneys general than the IRS. And, and most commonly, right, if you're if you have your tax, um, your nonprofit status revoked is because you haven't filed 990s over a number of years, right? That's by far the most common reason. I think it's, you have to file for three. If you don't file for three years, they automatically revoke. Yeah, and if you actually, um, the IRS's um, organization search, which you can, again, search by um, by EIN, um, they will tell you if this organization has gotten automatically revoked. Um, so that's a useful search tool. So it is very behind on filings right now. <laughs> so when nonprofits uh, file their 990 forms, are they obligated to provide proof of usage of the funds toward their mission? So do they have to show their receipts um, that's not something that gets uh, submitted to the IRS, but um, if an organization gets audited, then that does happen, I believe. There's much more request for a paper trail. Um, but the 990 is the primary tax document that organizations are filing. There are a couple of supplemental forms that don't get released publicly, um, but generally, um, as not a tax expert, um, <laughs> I don't believe that there's you know any sort of um, uh, drill down accounting that people need to submit. So Andrea, several people were curious about churches using religious exemptions uh, and and hospitals. And, you know, could we talk about sort of churches using religious exemptions? You, in fact, talked about a nonprofit turning into a, a church. You wrote about that. So talk about sort of churches vis-a-vis -vis filings. Sure. Yeah. And, and this is, this is an area where um, they're, they're the majority of organizations um, that you're going to 
stumble upon a nonprofit explorer actually have no filings ever. And sometimes that's because they're um, so small that they file a 990N, they make less than a certain threshold of revenue. Um, and again, you can actually find that in the um, the IRS's tax exempt organization search. Um, we don't currently import that. That's one of my hopes for <laughs> for the long term. Um, but uh, yeah, so there are a lot of very, very small charities um, that that don't have to file every year um, and then uh, or, or just have to file a, hey, we're still operating um, form. And then there's another bucket, which is religious organizations, churches and religious auxiliaries. Um, and churches are definition, definitionally a 501c3. So they are they are automatically a charitable organization. Um, they do not even have to apply to the IRS. Um, they, they don't have to say, hey, we're operating. Um, there are a lot of really small churches across the US. And so I think, um, you know, the the rationale is that it would be very onerous for like a small church that has a congregation of 50 to have to like apply to the IRS to get recognized. Um, so many of those organizations are presumed to be tax exempt but um, do not show up in our database, do not uh, file an application to the IRS. Um, and uh, churches and religious auxiliaries are not required to file a 990. Um, some do voluntarily, um, and some do actually, um, you know, the, the, the story I reported on the Family Research Council, I think last year, um, was about the organization sort of applying to switch from being a standard 501c3 to a religious organization that didn't have to file, they are still filing voluntarily, um, but they're no longer required to do so. Um, so that is that is one of the sort of um, areas where, you know, there there is a very large subset of organizations that are technically tax exempt, and um, you're not going to find a lot of information about them on uh, Nonprofit Explorer, just by virtue of how, how the tax code is written.